Well, I want to thank Jocelyn. That was was far that was way too gracious and far more than I deserve. And I and I just want to um, repeat what a lot of people have already pointed out. How I've just marveled since I've gotten here at the efforts and the and her tenacity in organizing this conference, which I just I think is first rate. And I think it's been a great forum and an exchange of ideas. And I think we're all lucky to be here and uh, get to share it. Um, I think this is my first time back in Texas, actually, since I came to, to watch the Sooners uh, beat the Longhorns, which seems to be kind of a tradition. Um, <laughs> but it's good to be here, and it always feels a little bit like home. Um, uh, when Jocelyn mentioned coming here to, to, to speak to you all today, she, she had suggested speaking about Iraq and, and journalism. And I'm always a little reluctant to do that. Um, one, I don't consider myself a pundit, and I'm not really an analyst. I think the best thing about journalism is is that we let other people do the talking um, and then try to capture what they say. But I guess I do have the virtue of, of having spent a lot of time there as a journalist, and that's the direction I, I want to take the talk today. Let me just pause here for a second. I, I have a tendency to talk a little fast sometimes and not all that clearly, so if people have trouble hearing me, please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, I first went to Baghdad in 1998 when I was a reporter for the, uh, the Associated Press. I went again in October 2002 as a, as a correspondent for the Boston Globe. And then in January 2003, I went uh, with the Washington Post. Now, I was hired for the Washington Post in that month, January, and my introduction there amounted to basically a, a few days of training on the computer and then a one-way ticket to, to Baghdad, which was a, about to see a war. Uh, I made it there a couple of weeks before that war, and then I ended up staying there pretty much off and on, and I've been there since, except for six months off to, uh, to write the book. Sometimes I ask myself, what did I know going in to Iraq? And to be honest, not all that much. Now, I think that could be a misleading question. Uh, someone could ask me now, what do you know about Iraq? And again, the answer I think is not much. Maybe, is that mine? <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> I interrupt my own talk, so. Um, but what I was saying is, you know, I think that same question could be asked now, and I think the answer again would be not much, maybe even, even less than I, I thought I knew when I was going in. In a lot of ways, I think that's probably the best conclusion that I've come to over my time there. What I think I learned as a reporter in Iraq was how complicated uh, the country actually was. And, and I want to start the talk by recounting a few interviews I've had with some people that I met before during the war and then stayed in touch with um, through the aftermath. Most of them at this point, in one way or another, um, are friends now. And I think they all represent very different perspectives. And, and I think most importantly, when I look back on those conversations, they all surprise me, which I think is probably the greatest um, thing we can encounter as a journalist. The first conversation took place uh, during my, my first visit to Iraq back in 1998. At the time, Iraq was a, was a really ragged place. Uh, attempted coups against Saddam, crises over Iraq's repeated obstruction of, of UN weapons inspections, and confrontations every two years or so with, with the United States had, had pretty much secured the country's place in the eyes of the international community. I remember at the time, many Iraqis would tell me that they, um, they would shake their heads as they heard the name of their country repeated over and over on the, on the popular Arabic language bulletins of the BBC. The sense of crisis seemed never ending. Um, and its relentless, relentless, cr relentlessness created a, a shorthand that I think made Iraq understandable to the rest of the world. It was America against Saddam. Saddam is a dictator, and its people were oppressed. Um, these categories were easy to define. Uh, they were easy to understand, and, and, and in some ways they were largely true. But in my visit in 1998, I kept on stumbling on scenes that were surprising to me. Uh, they suggested a nuance that I didn't expect before I arrived. Uh, sometimes they were whispers, other times they were shouts, and each, I think, complicated the portrait of the, each complicated the portrait that I had of the country. The conversation with a man named Rod was one of those moments. And I, I met him briefly on December 3rd, 1998, as I was walking in the covered market in Baghdad, his cramp shop was in a quarter dedicated to copper, and it was a, it was a boisterous place, a carnival of clanging metal. And I was alone there finally. I'd, back then in those days, we were always were forced to, to work with a minder, which was a shorthand for a government escort, and this government escort followed us around, made sure that people said certain things to us and that we didn't ask certain questions. And I had managed to lose him on that day. And I found myself alone, thankfully. Um, it was the first time since I had arrived. Um, and I was kind of reveling in this sense of anonymity. I stepped into a stall, and, and my accent unleashed a conversation. Why do, why do I speak Egyptian Arabic if I'm Lebanese? What passport do I hold? And then Rod mentioned Saddam. 
Now, he didn't say the leader, not His Excellency the President, not even his full name, just Saddam. The name rolled off his tongue dismissively. Uh, in the rest of the world, there are elections, he said. People elsewhere can throw out governments that are bad. Here, that's impossible. The people are the prisoners of the regime. I remember smiling faintly when I heard him say these words. Is he trying to bait me? I was a little bit confused. Why, why would he say this to me in, this, in these circumstances? But then as he talked, I realized that, that his disdain of Saddam did not translate necessarily into adoration of the United States. He didn't look to America as a savior. He suggested that the United States wanted to keep Iraq down. Fear drove its policy, he said, and it feared Iraq's potential. Then he speculated that America actually supported Saddam. Uh, he suggested that it wasn't America versus Saddam, rather it was America and Saddam lined up against the Iraqi people. This was Rod's view, and in those brief conspiratorial few minutes we talked, he spoke like a lawyer preparing a brief. How else could I explain the U.S. support for Iraq during the war with Iran when the Reagan administration provided Saddam arms and, more importantly, intelligence? He pointed to the 1991 Gulf War and what many Iraqis considered an American green light to the invasion of Kuwait the year before. He asked me how I could explain U.N. sanctions, which were backed by the United States. Over the decade, they had devastated Iraq's economy, making most of the people even more dependent on Saddam than before. Iraqi, the people Saddam ruled, had nothing to do with the invasion of Kuwait, nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, and Rod told me we were paying the price of the embargo. I remember hurrying back to the hotel after that conversation. I wasn't able to pull out my notebook as we talked. Uh, I got back to my hotel room and sat down and tried to scribble uh, as much of the interview down by, as, from memory. There was another moment in the same market. Again, I was on Multanebi Street, which is a, it's a storied and narrow alley that goes uh, pretty close to the market where I met Rod. For a generation or more, the street had served as, a, as the capital's intellectual entrepot. Uh, under sanctions, it embodied its plight. Its stores were lined with magazines 20 years old, textbooks from another generation, dust-covered dust religious tomes that seemed more for show than for sale. And more often than not, the street was a dreary, depressing flea market for used books. At the time, vendors were selling off their, their private collections in a desperate attempt to get by. And I was again alone. And a little bored, I walked into to one of the street's biggest and best-known shops. It was, it was called the Renaissance Bookstore. And it's a place I would visit time and again while I was in Iraq. Outside the shop was a copy of Business Week, I remember, from June 29, 1987. Who's afraid of IBM, the cover read. I remember shaking my head. Inside was Mohammed Hayawi. Uh, he was a bald bear of a man who was perpetually unshaven. Um, ours, again, was another one of these chance encounters, similar to the one that I had with Rod. Uh, and he seized the opportunity to talk. Iraq's invasion, in 1990, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990 was wrong, he told me. Quite, quite a bold statement for those days. Um, as an Arab, he said, he was embarrassed by the idea of an Arab country invading another Arab country. As a Muslim, he was ashamed of a, a war that pitted co-religionists. And he was still angry at Saddam for doing it. In fact, looking back, he said he could even understand the justification for the 1991 Gulf War when US, when U.S. troops attacked Iraq after the invasion. But now, like others, he said he could not understand the American obsession with Iraq and Saddam. Why the crisis after crisis? He listed possible justifications to me, and then he explained them away. For weapons of mass destruction, we don't have any. If we did, he declared we would have fired them at Israel. For our leader, what he asked, does he, do, have, to, does he have to do with us? Let me fast forward to five years later. Uh, this was during the war. I think it was the third or fourth day of the invasion, if I recall. And I was invited by an acquaintance uh, to spend a day with his family in Baghdad. I thought at the time it was a remarkable, uh, almost breathtaking gesture of hospitality. Uh, the country was at war, after all. And we sat around the table, which they had moved into a crowded room with, uh, with few windows. At the head of it was a man named Fuad, I'm sorry, Fadu Ahmed Saadadeen. Next to him was his son, Omar. Now, Fadu was a 65-year-old urbane former diplomat uh, from the northern city of Mosul. He had served in embassies in Iran, uh, Japan, Japan, China, and in his longest stint, the United States. He was educated at the University of Arizona, and I'm still in touch with him. Uh, when I look back on our conversations, I, I consider him a man of dignity and honor. He's a defiant nationalist who likes to speak his mind, uh, and his 32-year-old son is no different. Perhaps a little brasher, maybe a little more militant, but no less intelligent. And as we ate, the sound of bombs outside, I remember that Furu and Omar spoke with remarkable candor about politics, a subject that I'd really never broached in Iraq up to that point. At times, brashly, they discussed what was usually whispered. Furu was a critic of Saddam, whom he called rash. He and his son bitterly complained about his decision to invade Kuwait in 1990, 
bringing on the virtual destruction of the Iraqi military. Uh, after the war, as the Iraqi army was pummeled um, on the road from Kuwait to the southern city of Basra, they said they were ready to overthrow Saddam themselves. They had taken pride in the military, and they were angry at the way Saddam sacrificed it. We felt he humiliated it, I remember Omar telling me. Then I remember these words from Farouk. Iraq is ready for change, he told me. The people want it. They want more freedom. But both of the men converged in their denunciations of the very rationale of the American invasion. To them, the assault was an insult. It was not Saddam under attack, but Iraq. And they insisted that pride and patriotism prevented them from putting their destiny in the hands of another country. Here's what Farouk said to me that day. We complain about things, but complaining doesn't mean cooperating with foreign governments. When somebody comes to attack Iraq, we stand up for Iraq. That doesn't mean we love Saddam Hussein, but there are priorities. I remember that Fox News was on in the background. To Fudu and his son, that was the sentiment of real America, and they watched it as long as electricity lasted. Together we listened to the reports of the war. Then his father said to me words that I don't think I'll ever forget. Either you're with us or you're with Saddam Hussein, he complained. You have a problem, he said. He was addressing the U.S. government. You don't understand. They're rumblings, but these rumblings don't mean come America. We'll throw flowers at you. The last conversation that I wanted to recount was also during the war. Uh, it was with a man named Fuad Musa Muhammad, a retired psychiatrist. I usually called him Dr. Fuad. His son, Faraz, was, was an acquaintance of mine in Washington, uh, and he had reached me by my satellite phone in Baghdad during those days and asked that I check on his father to make sure he was okay. In the last week of the war, I did, and I went over to his house in the neighborhood of Mansur. Our first conversation, like, like the lunch that I just recounted, unfolded to the backdrop of this fighting. Uh, artillery thundered in the distance. I remember its regularity made it a little less threatening. Planes swept overhead, each run making for suspense as you waited for the bombs to fall. And in the background, there was gunfire. Basically, at that point, I was scared to death. Um, but not Dr. Fouad. Uh, even then, I remember he was exuberant and optimistic. I found him to be filled with resilience uh, and a, an indomitable sense of self that I think left him his integrity under Saddam's long years in power. He was there at his house alone. He, he had sent his wife to Beirut during the war. Two of his daughters were across town, and Faraz, of course, was in the United States. And on that day, we sat in the dark. Electricity was, was out by this time, and, and we talked about what was ahead. We've had enough, he told me. Really, we've had enough. It was one of those jaw-dropping conversations, much like the first one I mentioned to you, the one with Rod in the market. Dr. Fouad despised the government. As a Shiite Muslim, he listed the crimes of the government exiling tens of thousands of, of fellow Shiites to Iran in the 70s and 80s, its br brutal rule, eight years of war with Iran, and then an invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Iraq's resources and wealth were squandered, he said, and its people were deprived spiritually and materially. I'm quoting him again here. We hate this person, he said. We want him off of us. He's not only a dictator, but he's given nothing to the people. I think looking back on that conversation, Fouad was the kind of Iraqi that the United States had hoped to encounter once in Baghdad. While proud of his country, he didn't have that reflexive nationalism that I saw in Farouk and Omar. The war was against Saddam, he said, not Iraq. But as much as he anticipated Saddam's fall, even longed for it, he knew the American promises of liberation and democracy were not being made in a vacuum. There was a context, perhaps created by Saddam, but still present nevertheless. In the context of history, its legacies and its resentments, seen through a psychiatrist's eyes, was dangerous. He predicted that Baghdad would wait to see American intentions, but that the window of opportunity would be precariously brief. I like America, really, he told me. I like the American way of life. I like democracy and everything it offers. But at the same time, we don't know. I remember he shook his head, and I'm quoting him again here. If they say, okay, this is your country, we can give you all that you need, and then we'll leave, that would be great. But when you hear that American generals are coming to govern Iraq and that it will last one year, two years, three years, six months, this view, when you explain it to simple people, the majority, that would be very difficult. They can't digest it. To me, these conversations were, were fleeting but subversive moments. And they spoke to that swath of gray that, that I think despite this veneer of, of monochromatic repression, colored Baghdad in those years. They defied our expectations, and they defied our perceptions of what Iraq was. And now, what do I mean by that? I think in those days, repression in Iraq had, had become self-perpetuating. I suspect that no one ordered the, vast, the posting of the vast majority of Saddam's portraits that littered the city for two decades. Uh, 
obsequiousness has a momentum of its own. Make the repression white hot, and a culture of, inti- culture of intimidation will be created in its wake. I think Iraq was the most dramatic example of tyranny, but I think the same phenomenon occurred in Syria and Egypt uh, over their long decades of authoritarianism. Expectations create fear. Fear dictates behavior. It's, it's the discipline of terror, a, a diffuse, universalized threat. In Baghdad, I think that was easy to understand. That dynamic was very clear to us. Repression, after all, was the, was the presupposition that we as journalists brought to our coverage of Iraq. Time and again, that premise would blind us, though. Uh, seeing a society through the lens of repression left the nuances of Iraqi society out of focus. All journalists there, myself among them, had trouble understanding, had trouble understanding the exceptions to the rule, exceptions that perhaps revealed the most enlightening facts of Iraq's complexity, the sentiments, passions, and legacies that shape a society even in the most repressive of eras. We didn't listen to people like Rod, Muhammad Hayawi, Farouk, and Dr. Fouad. If we had, they would have showed us there was much more to Iraqi identity beyond Saddam's dictatorship. There was reflection and courage in Rad and in Muhammad Hayawi. Neither were devoted to Saddam nor were they admirers of the United States. They were members of a group defined by, by ambivalence and, and ambiguity. I think those are perhaps the most difficult sentiments to chronicle as a journalist. Farouk and Fouad, they were two men on opposite sides of the fence. For one, the invasion was an insult. For the other, it was a liberation. But they both saw a context. They both worried about what was ahead. They saw beyond a perception of Iraq as, fab- as a fabulously repressive place. They saw it as a country with a history, traditions, culture, and pride, and they knew, an occup- they knew what an occupation would mean to it. I heard these conversations and I reported parts of them, but looking back, I don't know if I really ever listened to them. At worst, I fell for my expectations. Repression that blinded me to nuance, words like rods that seemed so reckless as to defy credibility. At best, I saw ambiguity. And on reflection, it was ambiguity, ambiguity that came closest to truth in those days. And ambiguity, as I said, is something we all too often dismiss. And I don't think the prob- this problem was, was one of only, I don't think this problem was only of journalists either. Intentions aside, whether, I think, whether they were idealistic or nefarious, the United States never really understood Iraq. And I don't think it yet does. Time and again, we envisioned a city and country disciplined by this unrelenting terror a one-dimensional portrait of submission and victimization. And in part, this was true. Yet Iraq and its capital, proud but humbled, rebellious but humiliated, were, I now think, less like a black and white picture and more like a weathered sculpture, hewn in part by its proud past. That history still haunts it. Its present mocks what it once had. The sculpture is crafted, too, by the legacy of modern conflict and its consequences. The war with Iran, the decade of sanctions, a capital so brutalized by Saddam and immiserated that it was a shadow of what it was even a generation before. And that appreciation, I think, was always missing from the debate. Before the war and even as the bombs fell, I think, in in a way, Iraq had become its own theater. It was an actor on a grand stage. Uh, Its performance was interpreted, it was reinterpreted, and I don't think it was ever understood. When I look back on that, I remember the the gap in, in perceptions of what Iraq was. For other Arabs, Iraq was a symbol. It was a player in a grand drama. It was the latest victim of American power pardon me, the latest victim of American power, the latest instrument of, of conspiracy. For the Americans that same Iraq, the Arab, Arab world's potentially most powerful state was a potential beacon of change in the region. There was an ideological bent to the invasion that ran as deep, perhaps deeper, than the warnings of the threat posed by Iraq's suspected weapons of mass destruction or the danger of Saddam. If we can change Iraq, they believed we can change the Arab world. In the words of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, the way for America to fight terrorists was to, quote, drain the swamp they lived in. The rhetoric, idealistic to Western ears, rife with central colonialism for a third world audience, envisioned the dawn of a democratic and just Arab world guided by a benevolent United States. Neither the Arab world nor the United States anticipated the ambiguity of Baghdad, and by extension, Iraq. It It was inconvenient. Baghdad was once again transformed into an idea which stood for reality. It became a rallying cry, a rallying cry, a field for others' ambitions and grievances, and in dangerous conceit, they claimed to speak on its behalf. In the contest of perceptions, Iraq was passive, its future in others' hands. When I look back on the coverage of Iraq over the past couple of years, that narrative in particular strikes me. The narrative was the almost relentless determination of others to speak on behalf of Iraqis themselves. Liberation was one thing to Americans, another to Iraqis. 
To many Americans, it represented the end of their struggle with Saddam. To Iraqis, it marked a beginning, one still being defined. The same went for occupation. Even the words stood on opposite ends of a divide. To Americans, I suspect it, it conjured up images of, of post-World War II Europe with the Marshall Plan put in place to bring about a revival. To the Arab world, occupation means a far different thing. Much less Marshall Plan and much more Apaches engaged in battle against Palestinians in the West Bank. Democracy was no less a divide. To many of us, it was a vindication of the Bush administration, a decisive step toward a democratic future for Iraq. Perhaps, but I saw something slightly different in the streets of Baghdad that day three months ago when Iraqis went to the polls. I saw a celebration not over choosing a particular party or platform that would guide the country, after all the essence of what elections are about, but rather a euphoric celebration of rights long denied. To many, the election itself was what mattered that their very participation would set in motion a mechanism that would improve their lives. In some ways, the joy seemed even more palpable than after Saddam's fall. Iraqis, not foreigners, were the agents of change, of taking matters into their own hands. Do these two perspectives overlap? Indeed, they do, but they remain different perspectives. I often think that we as journalists rely too much on authority, or perhaps more precisely, the perception of authority. In the journalism that we've grown accustomed to in Washington, that may be unavoidable the workings of a government, the debate over policy, and the nature of campaigns and electoral politics, the very, list of, the very logistics of reporting revolve around a certain relationship to power and authority. That doesn't, however, apply to foreign correspondence. We can define our work more broadly. In a way, the best of international reporting is interpretive. The best of international reporting relies on voices, perspectives, frustrations, and hopes knit together by a context of history and its legacy. The best of international reporting relies on interviews. Through those interviews, we can avoid the danger of an overemphasis on officialdom. For people can define the story for themselves. They can allow journalists to say that we don't know the answer. Perhaps there is no answer. Perhaps the situation is ambiguous. That in itself is probably the answer. Those interviews, however, are the biggest challenge in covering Iraq before the war, even during it. And still today, they remain forbidding. Iraq is a dangerous place. For Iraqis, of course, but for journalists, too. Newspaper journalists, many of whom prided themselves on, on working low to the ground, have begun openly debating whether or not they should carry guns, ride in armored cars, put more concrete barricades in front of their houses. We're cut off from the very city we cover. If psychological barriers are my greatest fear, they are the greatest challenge to understanding Iraq's complexity. The question that should be asked is, is what happens when we're ignorant of how a city feels, how a city responds, how it reacts, its very energy. Will we make the same mistakes we've already made? What happens when we're forced to rely on others to define the experience in Iraq? What happens when officialdom tells us one story, and by virtue of our lack of choices, we rely on it as truth? Lastly, and most importantly, is there any way around it? And I don't know the answer to that question, but the question worries me. I worry that we won't hear what's being said. And when we do, I fear we'll listen for the black and the white rather than the gray. And the gray, like I've said, is what's best about our profession. I think back to my friend, Mohammed Hayawi. I saw him again after the election. He was a Sunni Arab, part of a community that largely boycotted the vote out of fear or principle. Uh, he was uncertain whether he would vote until the day itself. I remember him telling me, it was like someone inviting me to lunch. I can't say no. If I said no, this would be disrespectful. I sat with Mohammed at his, at his cluttered desk, and his words poured out, as they usually did. I knew that the paper I put in the ballot box was for America. I know I was being hypocritical, but there was no other choice. He waved his cigarette between his fingers. The future of Iraq is a line that goes through the occupation. If you ask me why I was voting, it's because I want to find something to pull me out of this mud. He looked out his window. Maybe this is the rope that will save us. Two years on, his complaints remained. Lines for gasoline in a country with the world's second largest oil reserves, less, less electricity than a year ago, his suspicion that foreigners were taking the profits from oil, whose production hovered at pre-war levels. But little else, neither past nor future, was conclusive. There's a wall that, that Muhammad passes every day in Baghdad, and, and so do I. On it is a slogan celebrating Saddam that's faded, a leaflet by followers of a young militant cleric in tones being an enemy of the oppressor. Partially blotted out is another slogan that declares death of the lackeys, and across the street is a promise to Shiite's most beloved saint, Imam Hussein. Nearby them is a heap of tin cans, plastic bags, wet orange peels and flies, underneath an injunction to keep the city clean. 
Muhammad's views that day is over what was ahead. Muhammad's views over what was ahead that day were like the wall itself. They collided and intersected, contradicted and agreed. They were gray. He sanctioned attacks on U.S. soldiers, but he recoiled at the car bombs and suicide attacks against Iraqi police and civilians. He worried about the growing sectarian and ethnic caste of the country, perhaps the most lasting legacy of the U.S. occupation. He was a Sunni, but did not identify himself, himself as such. The sectarian focus to him was the equivalent of all politics in the United States being refracted through the lens of race relations. It was there, but it didn't explain everything. There's a word that I've heard time and again as a reporter in Iraq. It is Ghamid, and it means mysterious and ambiguous. It's a word that has come to define Iraq to me and my experience there. It's a word that Muhammad uses often and understands well. I mentioned the wall to him that day, and he leaned back in his chair, and he nodded at me. The future? Ghamid, he agreed. He puffed his cigarette and challenged my assumptions. I challenge anyone to say what has happened, he said, what's happening now, and what will happen in the future. He shook his head. He felt quiet after saying those words. Then his lips tightened into a smile that I think can best be described as ambiguous. <laughs>